please welcome Ken Severson and Marion Nessel. Do you understand? Okay, hi, I'm Kim Severson. This is Mary Nussel, in case you were wondering. And we're, we're having a big argument about whether we should stand or sit. Right, <laughs> because as you can tell, she's very fit and like stands. I usually just sit around and schlub around, but um, we'll, we'll try to stand for a while if you want. All right. Okay. okay. We're compromised. And uh, yeah, so we're your pause that refreshes. We're here to talk about sodas and Coca-Cola. And um, I, you all know Marion Nessel, who um, I like to say I was quoting Marion Nessel before she was Marion Nessel, but um, <laughs> she's been um, just uh, really dry, has driven the, uh, uh, the food uh, reporting in this country in a lot of ways. She wrote about food politics and kind of busted open the USDA system and the, the way that uh, food companies affected um, nutri nutrition policy. Um, a long time ago, uh, starting a long time ago. And when did food politics come out? 2002. Okay, seemed like a long time ago. It was a long time. Uh, um, and now her new book is Soda Politics, Taking on Big Soda and Winning. So um, I had the, we had the distinct pleasure one Sunday afternoon of um, touring the world of Coke together just recently in Atlanta where I live. And uh, let me tell you, there's nothing more fun than taking the, uh, touring the world of Coke with Marion Nessel. So that was, no, it was, I mean, you, you could, this is like, you can't even believe this. So first of all, you pay $16 to go into the world of Coke museum, which alone. I'm old, it was only 14. Right. <laughs> which saved the New York Times a little bit on our expense money so we could have this panel here today. But thank you. Um, but talk a little bit about that. What was your first impression of the world of Coke museum? Well, it's just overwhelming. I had always wanted to go and, and I really shouldn't have written the book without having gone first. But first of all, you pay 16 or $14 to get in there, and then you're advertised to for the amount of time that you're there. And it's, and you love every minute of it. We did, we were like, I mean, well, first of all, it starts out, you start out with this video, the six minute video, doesn't have really any Coke in it, but it shows these like beautiful people having life experiences, like a soldier coming home from war and someone skydiving for the first time and uh, you know, little children being raised from their deathbeds. And it's like, you're just, right? I, oh yeah. There wasn't a dry eye in the house. And then there's a little Coke thing and you're like, yes. Yeah. And so then you stumble out into this museum in which sniffling. there were- Sniffling, sniffling. There were, they have, the map is, is in Hindi, it's in Chinese, it was in, in Mandarin. It was several languages. You could get the map to walk around the Coke museum. We saw a whole line of Tibetan monks walking through in their <laughs> saffron robes. I'm not kidding, I'm not making this up. You think I am. I've got pictures. Right. <laughs> So um, what was your takeaway from that? I, I, I... Well, the, the, I mean, there were things about it that were just so amazing. The young college students, most of them African-American who were leading everybody around, were phenomenally poised, skilled, articulate. Um, and Kim, who's a great reporter, asked every single one of them, so do you drink the product that you're advertising? They all said no. Right. They all kind of went, well, I, maybe a little vitamin water now and again. But, you know, but I mean, they were actually very forthcoming about that. Very few of them were, were drinking, uh, like to drink the product. It was very hard to find anybody who worked there who drank the product. Right. But then at the very end, the big payoff is they have these kiosks where you can go and sand little cups and you can sample all the flavors of Coca-Cola products around the world. So there's like the Uganda Coke version and the, you know, these, mm. uh, you know, peachy flavored drinks from Turkey. And um, so we were there drinking all of our sodas. 50 and, of them. Yeah, we did good. We, mm. we tried to rinse and spit. We, we did okay. <laughs> we um, but then you get to the end and there's all the Coke things. And honestly, the, by the end of that, the Coke tasted delicious to me. I mean, that, it really did, and I, you know, I live in the South now, and Coca-Cola is what you have. You put, we put on our pot roast there. I mean, it's, you yeah. know. I mean, it was, it was actually kind of shocking to realize how much better it was than, every, than every, all of the other ones. And I thought, okay, that's their problem. Didn't you feel refreshed at the end? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's their problem. They have a product that people really, really like. It's very high in sugar, ridiculously high in sugar. Not a word was said about sugar mm -hmm. in the entire place, nor anything about health, nor any of those other things that some of us spend a lot of time fussing about. Um, and you, you didn't talk about the gift shop. 
No, we were. We both. exited through. Uh, you exit after you tasted these things through a gift shop that's probably three times the size of this room, um, and that has a lineup of cashiers like what you see in Whole Foods, mm -hmm. with a great big long line of, with lights on them that go on when mm -hmm. it's the next turn, mm -hmm. and people had enormous shopping baskets of Coca-Cola memorabilia. I tried to talk you into those Coca-Cola earrings and you wouldn't, but she did look for the Coca-Cola bed sheets. She was about to buy them. They were $70 and I think she said irony has its price. <laughs> well, they were polyester. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but anyway, and so there was just the idea of that, that marketing moment and, you, and then we sat through an ad reel that took you through you know, just uh, uh, decades of, of really terrific advertising. Oh, yeah. uh, and you got, and you know, I could see in my brain all the places in which the pause that refreshes and Coke, it's the one and all, you know, and I, I knew them all by heart. So we're obviously up against a, a big challenge to reduce the amount of soda consumption. And, and Marion's obviously hit something. Um, she, the, the head of Coca-Cola for North America, Sandy Douglas, mm -hmm. you met with him just recently, right? Mm -hmm. So how did it come to be that the head of Coca-Cola wanted to call the person who's written a whole book saying, you know, calling, calling them out as the devil? It was your fault. The New York Times. The New York Times had the... Blame us, we're the media. Oh, why not? Yeah. Had this big article, this enormous article going on a full page in the inside about Coca-Cola's sponsorship of the Global Energy Balance Network, a group of researchers in Colorado and other universities who's, um, who had organized this group the Global Energy Balance Network, to propose that it doesn't matter what you eat and drink, all that matters in obesity is exercise. Um, and as a, as a result of the very, very bad publicity that that article caused, it was a public relations disaster for Coca-Cola because it, the, it, it looked like Coke was buying these researchers, and that's not nice or ethical. And so it was a terrible public relations disaster, and the head of Coca-Cola International, Mutar Kent, said that he was assigning Sandy Douglas, the head of Coca-Cola North America, to go on a listening tour, and that he would be going around and talking to people about um, what they were concerned about and how Coca-Cola could do better. And so the next day I got a call from Sandy Duggs, a personal call, no secretaries in between. I was kind of amazed, saying that he would like to um, come and meet with me. And I said, he mentioned a date, and I said, oh, that's just when my book is coming out. You've seen my book, haven't you? And he didn't know anything about my book at all. Um, and I thought, okay, these people live in a bubble. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was your experience when you talked to him, right? Didn't you get a sense from him that although technically her meeting with him was off the record, just between us here, <laughs> um, and, uh, and we, this will not go further than this room, I promise. <laughs> um, but can you talk a little bit about... I can see the tweets now. Right, I'm going right. to be following you on Twitter. Right. I mean, um. you know. I just, um, but, but tell us a little bit about, I, I think the, the caloric intake issue with him seemed to be a little bit of a disconnect. Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, he's the nicest person in the world, and let me just put that on record. And also, I think, totally sincere about being interested in public health, appalled by the Times story. They were completely blindsided by it, and I've heard this from lots of other people, so I feel like I can talk about this. But the, they were blindsided about it, and what he told me was that they had, he asked me if I had been to the Colorado facilities, and I hadn't been. And he said, well, they're state-of-the-art exercise physiology facilities, and that's what we thought we were funding. And he said, I didn't really understand about calorie balance, because the people in Colorado are, are the small moves people, and they argue that if you just change your caloric intake by 50 or 100 calories a day, you'll be able to maintain your weight, and you can easily walk off 50 or 100 calories. And tell us how long it takes to walk off a Coke. Well, it depends on how big it is. Okay, so if it's <laughs> 12 ounces. Like, what's the uh, one to walk to the Brooklyn Bridge? Oh, that's 20 ounces. Okay. So the standard 20-ounce count, that's almost, it's 275 calories. It's three miles. 
to walk from the New York City advertisement was Union Square across the Brooklyn Bridge right. and into downtown. For one to walk off 120 ounce. 120 coke. ounce. Oh, well, most people can't do that. And he didn't really understand that it takes that people who are gaining weight are gaining weight because they're over consuming hundreds of calories a day, not 25 or 50 or even 100. So I think there's a lot of education that could go on there. But he struck me as being just the nicest person in the world, genuinely interested in health problems, genuinely wanting to transform Coca-Cola into a company that's part of the solution and not part of the problem. And between that and the Coca-Cola world experience, I came away from it thinking that this is a completely schizophrenic company. Mm -hmm. That on the one hand, there's Dr. Jekyll, this really intelligent, thoughtful, caring person. Um, Oh, the parts of the company that are all about love and family and happiness. And good corporate citizenship. And, they and, do give away a lot of money for good yeah, things. A hugely generous company that funds just about everything. We can talk about that. Um, and, and then behind the scenes, there's the evil Mr. Hyde, who is making every one of these moves very strategically so that the company, the organizations that are funded are things like the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Family Medicine, health professionals. But let me ask you, so here's a company that has a lot of money to give away, and, uh, and they actually are giving a lot of money that helps a lot of foundations, a lot of people, and you know, mm -hmm. I mean, everything from, you know, our our symphony in uh, Atlanta to you know the Association of Pediatrics. I mean, they're 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 giving significant money that is working toward making the world a healthier place. Why is that so bad? Because they're still making mm -hmm. this. I mean, explain yeah. to me why that's. Well, they buy I mean, I think in their mind, yeah, it's easy. It's not a bad I mean, thing. The people that they're funding, if you, and one of the things that um, the head of Coca-Cola said they would do as a result of the Times article was that they would publish a list of all of the organizations and groups and individuals that they fund. Why didn't they do that while I was doing the research for the book? It would have made it. I don't know if you've so seen this much. list, but it's phenomenal. I mean, it you can find so it fairly easier. easily online. The list of all of the the things that Coca-Cola funds, oh. and it's it's phenomenal. Well, you scroll through it. It's very long. You scroll through it, and you scroll through it. And when you get tired of scrolling, you're only up to the Ds. Yeah. And you've got the rest of the alphabet to do. But there have been analyses of these of who it's funding, and they go into groups. So there's lots and lots and lots of health groups, lots of minority groups, African American and Hispanic, lots of pediatric groups, particularly lots of exercise groups, as you would expect. And of course, what this does is it buys silence. And so there are many, many examples, and I talk about them in my book, of um, Coca-Cola funded organizations or entities that were planning on anti-soda campaigns, and that after they got the grant from Coca-Cola, gave up the anti-soda campaign. Right, um, let's, let's talk a little bit about that, because one of the topics that we were um, supposed to talk about before we got off into the world of Coke is um, the idea of the soda tax. Ah, uh, yes. And, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, um, Mayor Bloomberg famously tried to do that. Um, I think 30 other cities have tried to introduce it. Um, and Berkeley has succeeded. They have. And we'll talk about that. Like, okay, so Philadelphia, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia received a pledge of 10 million over the next three years from the Foundation for a Healthy America, which is the soda industry lobby arm. This was mm. announced um, about three months, this is back in 2011, I think, three months before the soda tax was up for a vote. And so surprisingly, the pediatric hospital with, did not support the soda tax, but they had gotten, you know, clearly gotten this $10 million grant from the soda industry. Oh, it was, that soda tax it was terribly. clearly quid pro quo. Yeah, they gave, the soda industry gave more money to the city council races in Philadelphia than they had ever historically done. I think it was up by like an 800% increase from 2006 to the 2011 race when this was coming up. So clearly. This is the Mr. Hyde part. This is, this is, you know, the soda industry puts a lot of money into stopping these soda taxes. Berkeley passed one. Mm -hmm. um, and there was one report that's, the idea was that, and this is sort of a public health move, so you, it's like taxing cigarettes. You make it really expensive you're going to cut people out. So the idea was that the soda tax would be um, make the products more expensive so people may not be you know, choosing that. I mean, it obviously makes, it changes the public health discussion because you have all this discussion about that. But it makes it so when you go to buy that soda, it's more expensive. You might not make mm -hmm. that choice. Um, one study in Berkeley said that the uh, retailers were not actually upping the price of soda. Well, as actually, they, they are. Thought. 
So the, tell me the, what, what... Well, the know. most recent report that's come in said that that cost is being passed on to the consumer. Um, they don't really have... Is there any so, is soda consumption going down? Well, they don't there? have that information yet, and it's going to be very hard to prove in Berkeley because they never drank They didn't drink soda to begin, to begin with. with. So... <laughs> but... But the right. soda tax is generating more than $100,000 a month, and all of that money is going into child health programs. Right. So, so that's been terrific. Right. So even the, the Chez Panisse Meyer lemon soda would get taxed if you put it on there, just so you <laughs> If know. it had enough sugar. If it had enough sugar. Okay, so, um, so Mexico was the oh, other, and Mexico. We just, we'll talk about this because that just yeah. changed. In, in 2013, uh, the Congress passed, I think it was a one peso per liter tax, um, and uh, they drink 40% more uh, sugar soda than we do in America, which is kind of... They have three-liter bottles. Right. So, um, but just yesterday, they... Just tell, tell yesterday. Just yesterday, the um, government of Mexico reduced the tax from 10% to 5%. And the 5% is exactly the cut point below what the standard amount of sugar is in full sugar sodas. Okay, so explain that to me again. So what they did was move the move the soda, um, the amount, the 5%, to, that means that if, a sh if a drink has 10% soda, or was it? The no, 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 the the, it's 5% of the cost. Oh, okay. So, so instead of having a 10% tax, they had a 5%. Okay. So they have the tax. Um, and the reason- oh, why, yeah. Oh, because it was working. It was working. Soda sales are down by 6% in Mexico. That's mm -hmm. huge. And actually, That's it was down 17% among the poor in Mexico you, City. For well, and in Mexico City, but not in rural areas, because in rural areas, the soda companies reduce the price um, in order to keep the sales up. Mm -hmm. um, sodas are very heavily entrenched in Mexican culture because the water supply is not very good. This money was supposed to go to fixing water supplies. It's not clear that it's really doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big problem. But this was a big shock. The soda industry lobbied heavily, and they have a lot of power in Mexico, a lot of political power, and they got the government to reduce the tax. Do so. you see soda taxes, uh, it sort of seems like they got defeated. They 30 cities only passed mm. in one. Do you think soda taxes will come back around again as, as a Oh, they are around. Tool? I mean, there are lots and lots of people who are, who are looking at them. But the point about soda taxes is they raise the issue in public consciousness. And every time you have a discussion about soda taxes, you're having a discussion about the health effects of drinking your sugar. Mm -hmm. And that's really what, what's useful. I mean, sales are going down in the United States by 20 to 25 percent. So we're making real progress on that. I, that's why the print this is in my subtitle, or end winning. Yes. That's the end winning part of it. I thought the Times article was an end winning, mm -hmm. that the New York Times would write an article about something that's been going on for years, which is soda, which is soda companies' funding of researchers. Yeah, right. Well, we, you know, I can't tell you how many um, scoreboards across the South and Friday Night Football lights have is Coca-Cola oh, scoreboards. Sure. And so we have um, some time for questions and discussion. And so, uh, you all want a Coke right now, don't you? You're thinking, oh, it tastes good. So I think you might. In the, let's go in one. the back, and then we'll we'll trade sides. So if we can start back here, just because people in the back. Yell. Oh, as a former Times food reporter, um, considering the nicest man in the world, uh, given all what we've been discussing and their, and their means and all, it's difficult to believe that he had a sudden enlightenment when he met you, Marion, <laughs> about these issues. Oh, I would um, like I to mean. think that he did. <laughs> and, you know, does this kind of thing come from the top? And what are, you know, where are these decisions coming from? Well, they're two different. I, I mean, I was puzzled by that's why I said I think it's a schizophrenic company, that the public face of the company is we're about love and happiness. And we really want to do something about public health. The private face of the company is let's do everything we can to protect sales of our most profitable beverage. The profits, Coca-Cola is still doing very well. And it's doing very well um, because it upped its marketing by $70 million last year, um, which I think is interesting. So it's now about $270 million just for full sugar Coca-Cola. And last year it was. Um, Seventy million well, and, dollars. And bottled water, Dasani bottled water. But that doesn't make up the profits. Really? Yeah. So the business aspects are that full sugar Coca Cola is the most profitable product, huh. and particularly in fountain form. Yes. You know where the profits are extraordinary, and so the decisions have to be coming from the top. 
They have to be. And so I don't, I mean, I thought he came across as perfectly sincere. Uh, he didn't come across as a sneaky, devious person at all. Right, but, that, but the company's policy is clearly to sell more soda. Move it over, we'll move over. the marketing overseas. We'll get over here in a minute, but let's get through as many of these, yeah. I'm just curious um, about diet sodas. That this seems to we always talk about the ones with sugar and what mm -hmm. part the diet soda plays and diet what soda your opinion yeah, is are good. about. Oh uh, my, not I don't know the answer to that. Uh, they're not. They don't do any good. That's for sure. And sales of diet sodas are down too because people don't like chemicals. Um, and the chemicals have a bad what name. What percentage are diet sodas to? I, I in the in this country, thirty. Okay. Um, and the sales of those are down too. There's no evidence whatsoever, except in industry-funded studies, that diet sodas help people maintain or lose weight. Um, so the real issue is whether people like them or t like the taste or are worried about the chemicals. And the holy grail of the soda industry is to find an artificial sweetener that tastes like sugar. They're doing a stevia one, right? Yeah, it's not Coke, clear how it's Coke doing. Coke Life, New Life, Happy yeah, it's Life. Yeah, it's Coke Life. Remember, we couldn't taste right. it. We looked for it. We asked for it. They didn't have it. And Sandy Douglas told me that it's not ready for And it's for stevia, fountains. and it's called... And it has acyl sulfame K as oh, well. Oh, thank God, because I'm... That's... I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. um, we'll go right there in a minute. This guy over here had his hand raised, and then we'll go right here, okay? It's called Coke Life? Coke Life. Life. Coke, Coke Life. Life. Yes, it has a green label on it, so it's being greenwashed. Excellent. Um, yes, go ahead. As a guy who used to work for Sandy Douglas, I, I know him well. He is a nice guy. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. <laughs> um, where does the tax money go, do you think? How about F&V or other fruit and vegetable campaign? Um, which tax money? In the, Berkeley? The soda tax money. The soda words, tax money we... in Berkeley goes to child health programs, public health programs, and playgrounds. Where do you think it should go if it's national? If it's national, I would like to see it and go to public health. But that's my bias. Yeah. Okay, over here. <laughs> I'm for health. <laughs> to be bold statement. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Just a few weeks ago, I bought at a sea town for two for one Tropicana, and I noticed on my receipt that one is taxable. So I go over to the manager, I say, What's the tax over here? He says, The full juice, which is uh, non dietetic, is not considered a soda, but the one, the 50 call, which has a lot of water, is now considered a soda, and he taxed it. Really? So the Trop 50 thing that we're seeing advertised was taxed, and the full juice, which had as many, ca more calories, <laughs> yeah, probably. wasn't taxed. Yeah. That's interesting. Oh, these rules are very hard to write. Right. I Where mean, one, one of the reasons for the we'll tax on this. full sugar sodas is that they're, in public health terms, low-hanging fruit. They're a really easy target. They're sugars and water and nothing else. Juices have vitamins, minerals, and some fiber. So that puts them in a different category and makes but, it much more complicated. But drinking juice, is juice a healthy choice? In small amounts, yeah. Okay. Little amounts. See, now I'm going I'm to readjust ounces. my diet. There's, yeah. We have people here, and then we'll get to you. So I'm curious you. to uh, expand the notion of taxation and where that comes from. I know that it's a, a large um, public health issue with all of the sugary drinks, but with a burgeoning lack of uh, access to clean water and all of these sodas utilizing that clean water, especially in the U.S. and developing nations, mm -hmm. what if we were to shift the tax on the consumer and limit the access to this, the water that Coca-Cola and other uh, soda companies can use? Well, that's an interesting idea Are you because, because in, uh, certainly in developing countries where you know the sales are down in the United States so all the marketing has is moving overseas or vast amounts of marketing and both Coca-Cola and PepsiCo have pledged to put five billion dollars into marketing each in Africa India China and Latin America so that's 20 billion dollars over the next five years um, to market their products there and they're drawing on local water supplies and in India in particular it's an enormous problem. One of the reasons why these drinks are cheap is they use public water supplies. Yeah, that's a good point. Oh. Um, did back row, we had one question there, and then you, and those are, I think I'll be our last two if we're quick. So. They lobby on that issue, but. Right here, she's, can you raise your hand? You've had your hand patiently raised. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, hi. Um, I read recently that with soda sales on the decline, that Coca-Cola has been moving into the fluid milk market, and they have a new product out that's you know has protein in it and is basically mm -hmm. marketed as milk, but it's like you know they take all everything out of it and 
put it back in. It sounds really highly processed. I'm just curious. Yeah, it's a very highly processed milk that? with added protein and other kinds of things, and it'll sell at a premium price. Will people buy it? We'll see. Is it on the market yet? Do you know? I'm or? not sure. I haven't seen it. Yeah, it's I, on the and what's it, it called? Fair Life. Fair Life. Fair Life. Thank you, Stephanie Strong. Thank She's you. a pays to have my reporter colleagues in the audience. She knows <laughs> things. Great. So, Fair Life. All right. And we had a question. I think this is going to be our last one, but thank you. Yeah. So, I guess two things. One, it seems like uh, part of this is like the tobacco companies and Exxon and mm -hmm. climate change that they know all the research, just that how much they want to say is actually happening, right? So, they're controlling it. So, now there's the move to put real sugar take the high fructose. Oh, yes. The cane uh, sugar, the hipster sugar. sugar. The hipster, <laughs> sugar. hipster so, sugar in there. So the question is, I don't think we can compete against the marketing dollars. It needs to be a people like those here. So how would you mobilize people? Well, it's happening. It's already happening. The soda companies think that sales are down because of health advocacy. Who am I to argue with them? <laughs> you know, they're doing all that research. That's what they report to the Securities and Exchange Commission every year, that obesity is the biggest problem to, and the biggest threat to their profits. Um, so that's working, and we just need to do more of it. Mary Nessel, everybody. Thank you. Nice job. Great. <laughs>